So my first question is about the relation of your countries with Soviet history and it, its influence on the national identity of your country today. And this question is not out of the scope because we see that in order to anticipate the war and to understand Russia's intention, it is as important to understand Putin's vision of history as much to count the military equipments. We have two extreme examples today with Russia, where many Russians are nostalgic from Soviet Union and Stalin is the most popular historical figure. And on the opposite side, Ukraine, that started the decommunization, dismantled monuments to Lenin after the Maidan revolution and commemorates now the memory of Golodomor, forced starvation under Stalin. And uh, this genocide was recognized by many countries and Georgia and Moldova too. I'm not sure about Kazakhstan. You will correct me, Mr. Vasilenko, if Kazakhstan recognized it. So my question is, where are your respective countries on this scale between these two extreme visions of Soviet history? How does this past continue to define your identity, your present, and what's the influence of the Soviet period on your national identity today? And 30 years after the fall of the Soviet Union, can we still speak about the post-Soviet space? Is it still united with the only factor that continue to keep this space together is the relationship, bilateral relationship with Russia, with a different kind of pressure on energy, other security and other different matters. So how do you define yourself today, the space and you in this space? I will start with Mr. Vasilenko. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Tatiana. Yes, uh, indeed, 30 years have passed since the end of the Soviet Union, and uh, by now, more than 50% of Kazakhstan's population is under 30 years of age. So they don't know how it was under the Soviet Union, and uh, they basically, like the entire country, is looking, uh, are looking into the future. Uh, going back to uh, history, though, uh, it was a complex history of uh, us living under the Soviet Union, and uh, true, there were positive things, but there were also negative things, and one only need to mention collectivization, or which caused the death of half of the population in Kazakhstan in the early 30s, or the Soviet nuclear weapons testing in uh, eastern part of Kazakhstan, etc., etc., or the location of gulags in Kazakhstan, and the exile of uh, dozens of ethnicities to our country. So today, uh, we uh, would like to think of uh, this space, as you call it, as our neighborhood. And the neighborhood and the neighbors with whom we need to build relations. Uh, of course, mindful of our common history in the past, of our common geography today, but also mindful of our common future, which we need to build together. Thank you very much. Olga Roshka from Moldova. Thank you. I think that language defines reality, so what we call it to a certain extent would define what, what it becomes. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, um, the countries, the, the 15 republics resulting after that were called the newly independent states. Obviously 31 year on, we no longer call them newly independent. The Commonwealth of Independent States is not as relevant or appropriate, right? Um, the post-Soviet or former Soviet Union, that's the parts that we in Moldova have not chosen um, and we don't necessarily see uh, it, that it defines us now. So the preference is that we use the present and the future to define ourselves. So. I would rather hear instead of post-Soviet Moldova and EU hopeful Moldova or uh, candidate for EU membership Moldova or reform-oriented Moldova, Western-leaning Moldova, shall I say, freedom-loving Moldova. So pick what you prefer. Thank you very much. You mentioned the language. 
uh, can you remember just to our audience the percentage, the number of uh, people speaking, Russian speaking people in your respective countries? Well, in Kazakhstan, it's uh, almost everybody, basically. And we pursue the trilingual, trilingual policy of everybody uh, needing to speak Kazakh, staying language, Russian, but also learning English. And for you, Olga, for your country? It's a, it's a hard question because many people are indeed uh, bilingual. If we were to look at the um, ethnic uh, minorities, then we have um, Ukrainians, we have Russians, we have uh, Gagos who are ethnic Turks, but are quite Russian speaking. So I would say, uh, whereas many people are bilingual, around 30% would choose Russian as their first language. Thank you very much. Vice Minister Dersalia, the floor is yours now with the same question about uh, your national identity, the place of Soviet history. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Frankly speaking, I, uh, I, I was preparing to answer <laughs> a lot of questions, but this is the question I have no idea how to answer. <laughs> because I, I don't know what is Soviet. <clears throat> <laughs> so, I, uh, so it's difficult for me to answer what is post-Soviet. About when talking about the Georgia, uh, it's definitely uh, for me it's uh, something like, uh, for example, uh, answering the question. That's how to say: Is France post-British Empire because during 100 years in Middle Ages mm. it was <laughs> it was occupied by Britain or something? So it's so distant from us that, in spite of 30 years, that I definitely would not qualify Georgia as the post-Soviet country. Mm -hmm. um, and only space where we can talk about post-Soviet, uh, if something's like this, and I, uh, if there is such concept uh, behind, there is post-Soviet in Russian-occupied territories. And what is anything Soviet, you can refer to these places. But uh, this 80% of Georgia, which is not unoccupied, which is uh, unoccupied, definitely would not qualify under that. Uh, and frankly speaking, it's, uh, it's um, even a bit uh, not uh, how to say. I would not say insulting, but not uh, not proper. Uh, mm. After so many, after three decades, even talking now, uh, are these countries post-Soviet or different? Thank you, Mr. Dostala.